Okay, first we're going to go over the most superficial layer, the epithelial layer, the epidermis. Epi meaning above, dermal meaning dermis. So when you think of the epidermis, I want you to think of a wall of closely packed cells that are going to provide the primary protective elements of skin. So each of these layers are going to contribute to different characteristics of the epidermis. But overall, this is a stratified squamous epithelia and is keratinized, that is, it is dry, and meaning it is also relatively impermeable and tough. It is avascular, like any epithelia, and like any other epithelia, it is continuously replacing itself. The barrier functions we discussed in protecting against water loss, abrasion, is largely due to these epidermal layer. The cells that make up the stratified squamous epithelia are called keratinocytes. And they're named keratinocytes because of the large amounts of keratin protein that they have. Different types and levels of keratin protein are found in the cells of each layer, and the more superficial keratinocytes are little but sacs of packed keratin which provide the waxy, waterproofing quality of skin. So although that superficial layer is the layer that is mostly keratin, all the cells in the epidermis are considered keratinocytes. The keratin in the deeper levels make up the cytoskeleton that will link the anchoring junctions and give the epidermis its structural integrity and mechanical strength. So the keratinocytes at all different levels of the epidermis are all coming from the deepest layer of the epidermis. These cells divide and as they do so they're pushed up superficially and will change their properties along the way. So you can look at this picture like a snapshot of the epidermis or the sequence of the stages of the cell as they move more superficially. So those deepest layer cells are continuously dividing and the most superficial cells are all dead. But that dead cell was that dividing cell only a month ago. So it's worth it to remind you here that epithelial is avascular and the deeper level cells are close to blood supply of the underlying areolar tissue whereas the more superficial level cells have moved away from the blood supply and it's one reason why they begin to die. Being dead though is basically their job as we'll see. So those dead cells are what you see when you look at another person and are just as important if not more important than the other layers. I'm going to spend the most time on the most superficial and the most deepest layers. With the middle layers, I'll just mention a few full bullet points. So we're going to start at the most superficial level, that is the layer that presents itself to the outside world, and this is the stratum corneum. This is the layer that will have become what is called cornified. They're bags of waxy proteins, and since they are dead, their organelles, including their nuclei, are all gone. These cornified cells are really the most important part of forming that epidermal barrier for the body. Because of the waxy proteins and the fact that there's no moisture needed to keep the cells alive, this dry barrier provides waterproofing as well as protection from pathogenic organisms, as most of them would prefer the moist environment that you find as you move inside the body. So you have these layer of dead cells at the most superficial layer, and these cells are shed regularly. They are the dandruff, shed from the scalp, and the flakes that come off on dry skin. The processes of dead cells flaking off like this is called desquamation, and your skin replaces itself about every month or so. And the last thing about the stratum corneum is that it's the main difference between thin and thick skin. The thickness of thick skin is due to the increased number of layers of the stratum corneum. Thick skin is also referred to as plantar skin and is located in two places, the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. So just deep to the stratum corneum is the next layer, the stratum granulosum. The stratum granulosum can be identified by the granular appearance of the cells. That is, the cells have been accumulating keratin and packets of lipids as they have been maturing from the lower layers. And at this point, they may start to release those lipids, which are going to help form part of the waterproof layer. So at this point, mind you, they're far removed from a blood supply of the underlying dermis, and so they're beginning to die. And as we move deeper, we get to a thicker layer of cells that are still alive, and we'll have interstitial fluid between the cells, 
but are building up more keratin and those lipid bodies. But besides the keratinocytes, there's also immune cells called Langerhans cells. There are hundreds of these within every square inch of your skin, slowly moving around and sending out their processes, protecting against invaders and alerting the immune system if anything does breach that epithelial boundary. And now to the deepest layer are all the cells that serve as a source for all those more superficial cells. Cells of this layer continuously divide to replace those cells ultimately lost by desquamation. They can also divide when your skin is growing either during development or across a gap created by a cut or wound. These are the basal cells of the stratum basal, which are keratinocyte stem cells. And besides their function as stem cells, they're also the cells that are connected to the basement membrane, which is the link between the epidermis and the underlying connective tissue of the dermis. These cells are the closest ones to the blood supply, which they need for their continuous activity. To identify the stratum basal and basal cells, you can just look for the cells that are in direct contact with the underlying areola tissue. So also within the stratum basal are an entirely different type of cells, not keratinocytes, called melanocytes. Melanocytes produce the pigment melanin, which is taken up by the surrounding cells of the stratum basal and stratum spinosum. What the pigment does for those cells is to protect the DNA in the nucleus from UV damage, which may cause mutations in the DNA leading to cancer and other abnormalities. Melanin comes in a few different shades or hues, from more yellow to oranges to various shades of brown. Sunlight, or really any UV radiation, is going to stimulate the production of melanin and is the reason you get a tan. The variation in skin color is not due to whether you have the same number of melanocytes, but rather how much melanin a person produces, the size of the melanin granules, and the particular color. Notice there are no melanocytes in your palms and bottoms of your feet, so everyone's pretty much the same color in those locations. So the melanin is a factor in your skin color, and then the other major factors is due to all the blood vessels in your skin, and the pinkness comes from the hemoglobin of the red blood cells. So all you gotta do here is think of someone blushing to see the tone of their skin change. So the last contribution of skin color is due to the amount of carotene obtained from diet that accumulates in the epidermis and hypodermis, giving skin a more orangey color. So those are the three factors contribute to variations in skin color. And here is a summary of the particular functions of each individual layer. And before we leave the epidermis, the other function of the stratum basal, remember, was to provide a connection through that basement membrane to the underlying dermis which brings us to that other main layer of the cutaneous membrane for next lecture.